1 Corinthians 13. The first part of verse 8, Paul having uh, told the Corinthians what, what love does and does not do, what love is and is not. Going through these powerful statements says love never ends. Love never ends. Love keeps on loving is the picture there. Love keeps on loving. It was the mark. The indistinguishable. I mean, it was it was an infallible mark of New Testament church. Remember the progression of things when when they first began to gather after the day of Pentecost. They were spoken of as followers of the way, taking a partial line from Jesus' description of himself that I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And as the followers of the way, that was one of the kinder things they were described as, they would gather together. It's always a lot of talk. Going to be an Acts 2 church. In Acts 2, 42 and following, you'll remember that one of the fruit, one of the results of, of Pentecost, the Spirit coming in that downpour, no longer hovering over the people of God, no longer indwelling individuals as he did John the Baptist who was a prophet. Now in the downpour of the Spirit at Pentecost, everyone confessing Jesus Christ as Lord is filled with the Spirit. Everyone confessing Jesus Christ as Lord has the Spirit dwelling in him. One of the great realities ushering in the, the new covenant era. People in the outside world, some of the writings that were written to describe by Roman historians to describe this new phenomenon, they would say things like, behold how they love one another. Love was the theme. Love was the hallmark. They were developing their theology. We've been, re we've been seeing that develop as we're looking at the New Testament on Sunday nights. So you could say that they were, they were growing in their, in their doctrine of, of man, of sin, of origin, of God, of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit, of the church, of justification, of sanctification, uh, all of those, all those marvelous things that Paul takes up in Romans. They were growing in that, but they were immediately gripped with agape. People from the known world had gathered at Pentecost, coming back for one more Passover, being good Jews. And the gospel was preached, and multitudes were saved, and immediately the, the little, the little ragtag Christian gathering in Jerusalem found themselves as stewards of thousands who had confessed Christ, many of whom did not return home. What were they to do? They were to love. They were to show love. Great love has no man than this. Jesus said that a man lay down his life for his friends, and he modeled that at the cross. But that was to be their response. In John 13, having washed their feet, he said, you call me master, and you're right, I am. 
If I, your master, if I, your Lord, wash your feet, how much more should you wash one another's feet? And blessed will you be when you practice this, that, that tangible expression of self-denying love. It marked out the early church. But as everything happens, there can be a, a robbing of that, a perverting of that. And you find in Jude, verse 12, an interesting statement. Jude is describing these false teachers who've slipped into the church. He doesn't have kind words for them. In fact, we're not going to read everything he says about them today. We're going to focus on one verse. These, talking about these false teachers who are disrupting the church, who are undermining its fellowship, its unity, its mission, these are hidden reefs. I don't know if you've spent much time in the, in the ocean or not. But you know what can happen to an inflatable raft if you hit a hidden reef? It will rip it, gouge it, and your raft will deflate. It'll sink. Hidden reefs at your love feasts. You see, they had developed in the New Testament, and, you, and we're going to see a couple of references here. This movement from what you and I call the Lord's Supper, Paul chides them in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, don't you have food to eat at home? You, you come together for this experience, this memorial, and you, you're, you're pushing and shoving, and you're only thinking of yourself, and you're not practicing the very spirit of self-denial that is, that is focused in this. So they began to develop where they would have what we would call the Lord's Supper and a, and a fellowship meal along with it. And this term love feast, it's, it's, a, it's a Greek word, uh, agapai. Do you hear that? Well, not pi, P-I-E, but agapai, which is from the word agape. This expression of love. It was a fellowship meal that the Christian community celebrated with joy in conjunction with its celebration of the Lord's Supper. As a concrete manifestation of obedience to the Lord's command to love one another, it served as a practical expression of the koinonia or communion that characterized the church's life. Remember now, this, first, this early church was made up of a lot of slaves, a lot of people who had absolutely no control over their schedule. And yet they went out of their way to meet with one another on the first day of the week. That's why I think there's going to there's come fire and brimstone and wrath upon the West from the heavens above because we have more freedom and liberty than any society in the history of the world. And rather than professing Christians, seize that liberty to gather faithfully as an expression of love for Christ and love for one another, it is, the attitude is, well, if there's not anything better going on, you can count on me. I'm telling you, heaven does not smile upon that. These brothers and sisters in Christ in China who were arrested and slaughtered, trying to keep their facilities from being burned down by the Chinese government, keep them from burning their Bibles, their precious Bibles, wouldn't dawn on them to go catch some other event during that time. They value time together. And so did the early church. And so will any church that wants to be a church that has the smile of heaven upon its life and labors. The only explicit reference to this agapi is in Jude 12. They, they're reefs at your love feast. They, they feast with you without fear. In other words, they're carrying on as if they're one of you, but their lives, their commitment's very different. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds. Listen to that. Waterless clouds. You see, it may not mean much to us now. We've had a lot of rain, but I promise you there are portions of Oklahoma that would love to see some rain clouds. But when the rain clouds turns out to be just a, just a dark cloud with no, producing no water, it is, it is useless. It gets, it gets your hope up only to have your hopes dashed. Swept along by winds, 
fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. He's talking about what's going to happen when it doesn't bear fruit. Powerful pictures here of people who were, who were perverting the love feast. But the love feasts were a reality. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves. This is, the, this is the aftermath. What does church look like when the Spirit has come in a downpour upon the people who make up the church? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You could, they valued it. You could count on their being there to, to absorb it, to take it in. And the fellowship, the koinonia, the... Uh, it's great to have coffee and cookies. It's, it's great. To, but this was the koinonia. This was the, the shared life. One hurt, they all hurt. Can you imagine that? They. Who's this, the, this, in the aftermath of Pentecost, thousands of people suddenly are, are found. The apostles couldn't even know the names of these people. And the little 120 who'd been gathered in the upper room, who were, sort of, who, were the, who were the spear, the tip of the spear of the church, find themselves with thousands of brothers and sisters in Christ who didn't come to stay, who don't have jobs, most of them in the area, but who have needs, food, shelter, clothing. They continued in that shared life to the breaking of bread. And this is, this is when you read commentators, just to give you an idea. Commentators wrestle this term, the breaking of bread. Is it a reference to the Lord's Supper or is it a reference to the fellowship meal? And, and many of the better ones will finally say the answer is yes. It was, for them, it was a common experience. For them, it was unthinkable that you would, that you would take the Lord's Supper and tell everybody bye-bye. It was unthinkable that you would pass on the Lord's Supper and show up to eat. It was, it, they, just, they didn't think that way. It was, all, it was all a part of the package of having been on the receiving end of the redemption drama that started in the upper room that night with Jesus showing what self-sacrifice looks like by washing their feet and then teaching them that the, that, that the bread and juice are all about Him. And if they're going to make it all about Him, then they will devote themselves to one another. It, it was a that would move him to the cross and, and be crucified, then three days later rise from the grave. And two verses down in Acts 2.46, and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. Again, the discussion comes up, okay, what, what was that? Was, was that the Lord's Supper? Probably not. This is the ongoing koinonia, the fellowship, the, their love for one another. And I'll be honest, I don't even, I don't even, I'm not able to wrap my mind around how people, 120 people who made up some, several homes in Jerusalem were handling caring for thousands of people. I don't, I don't have that capacity to take that in, but they did. And it was a challenge because most of Paul's ministry, remember, most of Paul's ministry traveling around once he was converted, once he stopped killing Christians and began to, to take the gospel to people, he would talk about the collection. The collection, the collection. It was always on his mind. The collection, don't forget the collection. When I come, I hope the collection is ready. I'm going to send so-and-so to get the collection. It was about getting money back to Jerusalem so they could keep taking care of the saints. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. One of the descriptions as you read further in Acts is that no one claimed that what he had was his own. He, he realized, God's given me this. I'm a steward of this. There are people in my, in my family of faith with needs. We need to come up with a way. Barnabas sets the example. He steps forward, sell, sells some possessions, and brings the money and lays it at the feet of the, of the apostles. It was a fascinating day. They had a social meal connected in some way with the celebration of the Lord's Supper. That's what we've tried to model here. We don't have a fellowship meal at the end of a service on Sunday because, because we're too lazy to fix something at home. We do it because if you study the Testament, it's an outgrowth of this. 
It's a continuing expression of koinonia. It's a continuing expression of fellowship. It's a, it's a, it's a tangible expression of love. When, do you realize when you bring food from home, you are showing love for your brothers and sisters in Christ here? And now that doesn't mean when you don't bring food from home that you're not showing love. In fact, that kind of dynamic allows all of us to share. It's the way that we can say, look, if you forgot today, if it, you didn't think about it, maybe you couldn't even afford it. We love one another enough here that we want to be sure that we can gather and eat when this service is over. There's a passage in Acts 20. I want to read this and wrap up with this. Verses 7 to 12. On the first day of the week, remember, that was the, they just... As a result of Jesus' teaching, they gathered together. It wasn't convenient. It wasn't even ritual. Ritual would have been the last day of the week. On the first day of the week, commemorating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when we were gathered together to break bread. Was that the Lord's Supper? Is that a fellowship meal? Yes. Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. Now, I want you to think about that next time you think I go long. He went on till midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, was a big crowd there. I don't have any notion that Eutychus's parents would have let him sit in the window if there were been other places to sit. They probably said, "Hey, you need to go sit over there, so 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 and so can sit here." Sank into a deep sleep. I take great comfort from that. If people fell asleep while Paul was preaching, as Paul talked still longer, <laughs> and being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. Now, I've had some strange things happen in 40 plus years of preaching, but I've never had anyone fall down and die. Thank the Lord. It's like the fellow that was walking into the service with his, with his grandfather one Sunday, and there were these plaques on the wall in the foyer, and he said, Grandpa, what's, what's this? Well, this, he said, these are, these are plaques remembering people who died in the service. And he said, is that the morning or evening service? <laughs> Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, said, do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, folks, this was, a, this was a church that just went with the flow. That would have stopped most services right there. He conversed with them a long while, until daybreak. Now, hang with me here. They had the Lord's Supper. Paul preached till midnight. He continued in a dialogue with them until the sun came up. And then he departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. <laughs> That's the way of saying they were, they were incredibly gripped with comfort. But that was their flow. Whether they only had a short time to meet or a long time to meet, they worked into their existence this reality. You see the background of this, and I won't go into this because we've got to wrap this up, but first century Jews valued fellowship. And the Passover was a great center point, focus point in the home. Families, groups of families and friends would gather together for this. Not everybody could afford a lamb. And so they would they'd be thoughtful and say, you know, we need to have so-and-so over for Passover. They were just, you see, when, you, when you have the heart of God upon you, you cannot keep it to yourself. The heart of God that beats in you beats through you. And this, this is the mark, the hallmark of the early church. Otherwise, they would have been scattered into 10,000 pieces and never heard from again. But they hung together because of that agape heart birthed in them by the Spirit. 
Jesus cultivated this in the 12 in the time that he was with them. When he used it as a time to teach. And they had great joy at eating with their rabbi until that night when he totally turned the meal in a direction they'd never anticipated. What's the point? Verse 8, love never stops loving. Let me just say this as we close. If your love for your brothers and sisters here has fizzled, is, is waning, I pray, I pray that God would cultivate a new and a fresh in you. I was reading something the other day that really just pierced my heart. Do you love preaching or do you love the people to whom you preach? I said, oh God, I do love preaching. Dear God, never let me live to see the day when I love preaching more than I love the people to whom I preach. Because Paul says that sounds like a clanging symbol. You love teaching or you love the people to whom you teach? It's a time to examine our hearts. Because if we love one another, Jesus' commandment, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, then, then there are things that ripple through that and, and flow out of that and, and change the dynamic. It, it should be that when we know Lord's Supper is coming, we know, oh, great. I'll get to see so-and-so at the meal and commune with them and fellowship with them. And that's, that's the way a New Testament congregation trains itself to think. When agape drives the train. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you here in Jesus' name. And Oh, come. We read these passages. Search my heart, Lord. Search our hearts. Before you, I believe I love these people, but Lord, search my heart. Discover in me any, any pocket where, where love is cooling, where other, other attitudes are, are, are filling in the gap. Help us to love one another as Christ has loved us. We thank you for putting us in this body. Help us to show our gratitude that we are full-time followers of Christ and not casual observers who name Christ. Sweep over us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand and sing as we prepare to dismiss for our...